Good. Thank you. you. May be seated. Well, I made it, <laughs> and I got up there and found out that the recorder wasn't working properly. Apparently, it hadn't been archived last week. The uh, disc, and so I had to archive it first before I could actually start recording. So praise the Lord, we made it. Okay, please take your Bibles and turn back to that passage that we looked at just a moment ago. Exodus chapter 12, verses 21 through 28. Exodus 12, 21 through 28. Pass it on, child training. We're doing part five today. A lot of interesting things that we've learned as we've been going through this section. And I trust, and it will come someday, you don't know when, just like the Lord's return, you do not know when it will be, <laughs> at morning, at noon, or at night, <laughs> but it will be when I have the most of you here, <laughs> that we'll have that test on Blofro, Lifefly, Mubo, Halo, and Daddy, the ten plagues in order, and by this time, if you haven't learned them, hmm. <laughs> I hope you have learned them. There's so much to learn in the scripture, but that certainly is one of the key incidents in all of scripture that's quoted over and over again in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, referred to by way of doctrinal and practical training for God's children and thus practical training for our children and our grandchildren and some of you are old enough, great-grandchildren as well. So we're over in Exodus chapter 12. We've just read verses 21 through 28. We're talking about child training, Pass It On, Part 5. I hope you're aware of the fact that our country is about to radically explode and implode because, and I'm firmly convinced of this, the last three or four generations of Christians in the United States have been so concerned with their own temporal comfort that they have failed to pass on a truly Christian heritage to their children, not just a matter of going to church, but a Christian heritage to their children, a Christian worldview. The last three or four generations have gradually been sucked into the morass of the vile filth of the humanistic worldview. And as a result, we're in the problem that we have today. The first area of failure, I'm convinced, is the failure to pass on sound doctrine. All around us we see so-called churches spewing out all kinds of things that have nothing to do with the Word of God. And a lot of the people who are in those churches had parents or grandparents who were in good solid Bible preaching churches. But because their parents failed to pass on to them sound doctrine, they're in churches today that are based on experience, are based on humanistic worldview, are based on emotional wiggles, but not based on the Word of God. You can be glad that we're in what's called the Reformed tradition, going back to the Protestant Reformation, back to the establishment of the Word of God as the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Sound doctrine, one of the three legs of the stool that we've talked about. There has to be teaching, the communication of truth. There has to be a godly example set by those who proclaim the truth. There has to be loving discipline by those who are in authority to those to whom they would pass the sound doctrine so that those younger generations will understand and know that this is important and that those of us in the older generation, I hope you are willing to give your life for it. You may have to in the very near future. Sound doctrine, the failure of uh, the generation to pass it on. What you really believe, what you really believe shows up in your lifestyle, what you do, but not just what you do. Here's, here's the real catch. It's what you excuse as permissible. You say, well, you know, for me, this is what I do, but after all, they've got their own lifestyle, they've got their own thing. They, What you excuse as permissible 
may be a glaring hole in the passing on of sound doctrine to the next generation. What do you or have you permitted your children to do? It's permissible. You really wouldn't want to do that yourself. They didn't do it in your generation. But after all, we're living in modern America. And so it's, you know, we excuse it. People, there are holes, gaping holes. Through which the enemy has been driving his tanks and reaching our children and our grandchildren. Notice how many things are listed that reflect modern America in the following verses that Paul wrote to Timothy and Titus. Paul is talking about the things that are contrary to sound doctrine, and he writes, things that God will judge. For whoremongers, is this country filled with adultery and fornication? Did you realize that something like 70% of the couples that finally do end up getting married have already been sleeping together? Checking it out to see if they really want to marry this one and they've been with other people before. For whoremongers. For them that defile themselves with mankind. You know what that means? That's Old English, but that means the sodomites, the gays. For them that defile themselves with mankind. For men stealers. Did you know there is more slavery in the world today than there ever was back during the time of the Civil War. Human trafficking. More of it today than back in the 1800s. We say, but we're not doing it here in America. No, but worldwide there is more of it today. For men stealers. For liars. Look back over the last week. Did you ever, in this last seven days sort of fudge the truth a little bit? I hope God brings something to your mind. Because we are so used to just saying something to get by. It's a way of life in the United States. For liars. For perjured persons. Hmm. People who swear under oath and then tell a lie. Common lying and legal lying. Listen to the last phrase. And if there be any other thing, in other words, Paul says, I'm not giving you a complete list here, and we could have read all the verses before this. If there be any other thing that is contrary to, what are the last two words? Sound doctrine. You see, sound doctrine keeps you from that list of despicable crimes and sins that Paul has just gone over with young Timothy, this young preacher boy who needs to understand that the communication of sound doctrine is absolutely essential for the preservation of the body of Christ. Sound doctrine. Did you know we're living in a time when they don't like the idea of sound doctrine? In fact, that's what Paul says is going to characterize the last days just before Jesus returns. Listen to 2 Timothy 4.3. For the time will come, and it's here, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Somebody who will scratch them behind the ears and say, I'm okay, you're okay, let's all just sort of get along, and don't stand up too much for anything, because if you do that, other people won't like you. So let's just sort of blend in, and the devil loves that. He gets the sheep all headed in the right direction, all lollygagging around and munching on their cuds until they fall off the cliff. Sort of like, like lemmings. Millions of them running into the sea every year because they follow the leader who's doing something stupid. The time will come, it's here, when they will not endure sound doctrine but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Paul writes to Titus about the qualifications for church leaders, for elders. And he writes, Titus chapter 1, verse 9, Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. This is what you must put a, a vice grip on. Do not let it go. 
holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. In other words, it passes from generation to generation to generation. How do you get here from back there? Generation to generation to generation. How do you get from Moses down to the children of Israel today? Generation after generation after generation. How do you get from the formers back then in the 1500s till today? Generation after generation after generation. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. Now get the next phrase that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. That is, somebody who is speaking against sound doctrine. Dear people, America has failed. The Christian generations in America from our founding fathers till today have gotten weaker and weaker and weaker until they're passing on nothing in terms of sound doctrine which is the foundation for our faith and for our freedom but they may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers he goes on in chapter 2 he doesn't give up that theme that chapter 2 verse 1 of Titus but speak thou the things which become, that is, which make attractive, sound doctrine. Not they're turning into sound doctrine. We use the word become in that way. But this is the, the word for adorning sound doctrine. Communicate it. Pass it on. Never give it up. Be willing to die for it. Yes, the first area of failure in child training for the last three or four and perhaps more generations of Christians in the United States has been their failure to pass on sound doctrine because what you really believe shows up in your lifestyle, what you do, and what you excuse as permissible. What things did you excuse in your children and grandchildren as permissible that you knew really weren't permissible but to get along? You let them do it and never said anything negative to them. After all, saying something negative is the, the worst of all the bugaboos of modern day life. Never say anything negative because after all, that might mean that you are judging somebody else. We've already seen how Paul cited the Passover and the Exodus narratives and tied eight key doctrines together in Romans 11 that stem from Christ fulfilling the typology of the Passover. Those are the obvious doctrines where you start, but that's not where it ends. Sound doctrine means that you have to study the Word of God. Sound doctrine means that you have to know the Word of God. Sound doctrine means that you have to be believing the Word of God, that you have to be living the Word of God. The sound doctrine. God uses Satan, we've seen, as an instrument for judgmental blindness, not only for wicked pagans, but for believers. And we need to teach that clearly to our children. We've seen many passages that teach us that chastening is actually a manifestation of God's grace. We've seen how a true believer, even a hero of faith, can reach a point of no return and come under the heavy hand of God like Samson. He's listed in the heroes of faith, but look what happened to him. God judges carnal believers severely, even those who are heroes of faith. We've been looking at the plagues of darkness and the death of the firstborn. The darkness of judgmental blindness, one of the key doctrines of Scripture that the last four or five generations here in the United States have failed to teach. A blindness that is followed by death. The United States today is in the plague of darkness. Judgmental blindness, which will soon be followed by, I believe, the death of this nation. That means that the believers in the United States are also going to suffer very soon. It appears to me that this upcoming election is the latch that's going to open the gate for the lions to eat the Christians in the arena. I hope you understand that. And don't just vote for the lesser of two evils. Don't just vote for somebody you think can beat the other side. You will give an account for how you use your vote in the primaries and in the general election. Now, over the last several weeks, we've seen multiple reasons why people don't understand the clear teaching of the Word of God. Number one, the preacher and all the other preachers, not only this preacher, are failing to actually teach the Word of God. Because if there's somebody else out there, everybody would go and listen to them. But 
the accusation means that not anybody is teaching it. They're only teaching their own ideas. There are many subcategories under that that I've already listed. We won't list them again. Number two, the preacher and all the other preachers don't give enough scriptural support for the propositions of Christian living that they're trying to communicate. Number three, this preacher and all the other preachers don't reference the Old Testament as much as Jesus did. Number four, a major reason that people don't understand the clear teaching of the Word of God is that they are under judgmental blindness leading to death. That was a key lesson in our text that we looked at last week. So, there are three things. Key principle, key application, key verses. We're going to add some another key to that today. But the key principle that we learned last week was Failure to apply doctrine in holy living always results in judgmental blindness. God will not give you more light until you obey the light that you already have. It's a matter of walking in the light, that is, obeying every day. You don't say to God, well, look, I know I've got light here for my path right now, two steps ahead, left foot, right foot, but I want to see 14 steps ahead. God says, no, follow the light I've given you, then I'll let you know where that light is. You say, but if I saw that light up there, then I could just walk toward that, God said. But what you don't understand is that if you walk directly toward that light up there, there is a great big black ravine between you and that light. And if you follow my steps, which seem to be going this way, you will get over to a bridge that will take you across to the other side of the ravine. But if I showed you 14 or 16 or 27 steps ahead, you would go running toward that and you would fall into the ravine and you'd be dead. Follow the light that God has given you now. Don't ask God for light down the road. Obey what you know now. When you see what God wants you to do now, do it now. Don't run down the road someplace where you think the light may be someday. Obey the light you've got now and God will give you the next step for the path. The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Your feet. Not a spotlight out there somewhere, your feet. Look down where your feet are supposed to go and look where the light is. Where's the next step? That's what God wants you to do now. Don't worry about tomorrow, the next day. You may not have tomorrow, the next day. You may be dead. Obey what God wants you to do now, not someday. That was the key principle. Failure to apply doctrine in holy living always results in judgmental blindness. God will not give you more light until you obey the light you have. Walk day by day in the light. Number two is the key application. Key principles first. Key application was second. The one that we made last week was, don't think that you know what you are not practicing now. The application, don't think that you know what you are not practicing now. If you're not practicing it, you don't really know it. You know, it's rather interesting. We saw those videos uh, a number of weeks ago, and they were talking about the way that the mind works and the way that the hands of a skilled concert pianist are able to play, and the brain is sending signals to the hands just milliseconds in advance about what the next note is going to be so the hands will be ready for doing it. Dear friends, if you're up here playing chopsticks, don't think that you're playing Griggs piano concerto in A minor. Don't think you're going to play a Brahms Rhapsody. Don't think you're going to play some something like The Winter Wind by Chopin. If you can't play chopsticks. The application is don't think that you know what you are not practicing. That is putting into shoe leather every day. You know, Archer Rubinstein was one of the greatest pianists that ever lived. And in a discussion once with a radio personality, uh, he said, if I don't practice for one day, I know it. If I don't practice for two days, my wife knows it. If I don't practice for three days, the world knows it. Practicing it, practicing your Christianity, putting it into practice, that is. That was the application. Then we looked at some key verses. So we've got key principle, key application, key verses. Some key verses that might describe some folks in our church and explain the problems that we have here. It's not a matter of head knowledge. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 2.18, And knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. Thou art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. 
We got it together, people. We got it in our heads. We know it. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Are you not practicing it? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? What do you think about when you look at somebody? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Covetousness is idolatry, Colossians 3, 5 and Ephesians 5, 5. Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou the God, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. And that was written to a good, solid, fundamental, Bible-believing, probably Presbyterian church <laughs> at Rome. The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. So-called believing is not enough. The issue is how do you respond by action to the truth that you know in your head? James makes that point clearly. In James 2.19, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. Knowing about God and knowing who he is and having had a lot more direct contact with him than you ever have, they know who God is, they believe in him, but they tremble. They're not going to heaven. They're on their way to hell. We closed last week with a solution. How to avoid the plague of darkness in the church. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8, 11, and 6, 12, and Colossians 1, 13. For you are sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Verse 11. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Not just walking yourself, but making sure that you are telling others they're involved in sin. Chapter 6, verse 12. Be engaged in spiritual warfare, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Understand that you are a soldier in the battle. This is how to avoid the plague of darkness in the church. Walking as children of light, reproving that which is evil, and we never do that, and our children never seeing us do that, and so they don't. And they just get sucked right into it. Be engaged in spiritual warfare. And you do that through prayer and fasting. You do that through the reading of the Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit. You do that through bold witness, unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You do that in standing up for that which is right and pure and holy and honorable and morally true. If you're not doing that, you're going to be walking in the plague of darkness. But that's how to avoid it. And as you do that, Colossians 1.13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. You begin to live what you know. That's the way to get out of the plague of darkness. We gave at least one practical application of that principle. Here's one of the areas where believers who fight with each other in churches, no church would ever be destroyed if this didn't happen. The only way a church could be destroyed is if the government under Satan came in and killed all the believers in the church. But here's the one that destroys most churches. He that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because the darkness hath blinded his eyes. First John 2.11. Church fights. So the challenge is, if you don't understand, what are you doing with the light that you already have? God's not going to give you more light until you do something with the light you've already got. And Jesus said, You are the light of the world. The city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The second main reason why people don't understand is suppression of the truth. We mentioned that in passing several weeks ago. Romans chapter 1, verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. That's a wrestling term that's used there. They grab it, they suppress it, they hold it down, they will not let anybody else know it. They try to keep it throttled. And the result of that, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And we see that humongous list of horrible sins in Romans chapter 1 because of people who have suppressed the truth. The third reason we've touched briefly on why people don't understand is they are unsafe. Paul makes that clear in 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 16. And he says, The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The natural man is the unsaved man. Paul makes that clear in the context. Unsaved people will never understand the Word of God. But verse 16 is really a wonderful verse, because it's going to get to a major point that we're going to make in a few minutes. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Have you learned how to think biblically? 
You know, years ago when I was in college, I read a book that I don't agree with everything that was in the book. So don't say, oh, Pastor Spencer believes in, you know, being a war press or tester or something weird like that. It's a book called The Christian Mind by Harry Blameyers, SPCK Press, out of Great Britain. After I read that book, I thought, wow, that's really the answer to why so many of my classmates think the way they do. Now, that was back in the dark ages of the 60s when I was in college. That's why they think that way. They don't have the Christian mind. They haven't started with God's premises, with his presuppositions. How can they come to the correct conclusions if they start with the wrong premises? I was studying logic back in those days. The Christian mind. That's what Paul talks about here in 1 Corinthians 2.16. Who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? He's talking about the natural man versus the spiritual man, verses 14 and 15. And he says, but we have the mind of Christ. Do you see everything the way Jesus looks at it? When you are about to make a decision, you need to teach this kind of stuff to your kids. When you are about to make a decision, because we're talking about child training here. I'm not just preaching a message about all these things. What do you need to communicate to your children? What are foundational elements that you need to communicate to your children? Teach them to think like a Christian. Not like a carnal Christian. Not like a, a natural man, an unsaved person. Teach them what it means to have the mind of Christ. How would Jesus look at this? Not just what would Jesus do. We all know the little WDJ or JD think they were on bracelets, you know. How does Jesus look at this? What is God's viewpoint on this situation, this set of circumstances, this activity? We have the mind of Christ. It's available to you. Do you use it? If you're saved, you have the mind of Christ. Is it in the open? Have you got it out of the box? Have you unwrapped the package yet? We have the mind of of Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is God incarnate. He came to earth. He lived in front of us. He showed us how to make decisions. He showed us what was important and what wasn't important. He showed us what to stand for and die for. We have the mind of Christ. We also touch briefly on the fourth reason people don't understand. They're carnal. 1 Corinthians 3, 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able, for you are carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? Paul says the same thing in Hebrews 5, 11 and 12. Of whom we have many things to say, speaking of Melchizedek, and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. In other words, if he's talking like that, he's talking about growing from childhood to adulthood. So these are things that we need to make sure that we're teaching our children so that our children can grow from childhood to adulthood as Christians and not as world thinkers. We talked about that, you recall, spiritual atrophy. Not enough to have known the truth at one time, to have practiced it a long time ago. You have to keep practicing it daily to keep strong. The minute, now listen, the minute you stop growing, you start dying. Did you get that? The minute you stop growing, you start dying. That's what happens to your muscles. No, you're no longer exercising them and making them grow strong. Just as soon as you stop doing that, you start dying. It may be slow. You may not notice it at first, but you start dying. Never forget that. Everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. Ah, there is where your exercise bars are located. There is where all these contraptions that you see at Walmart and down at the gym and all these places... <laughs> unskillful in the word of righteousness. The word of righteousness is your exercise machine, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use. Now, you know you can buy all that equipment. My boys have got a lot of that equipment. They use it, but, <laughs> you know, suppose you went out and you bought every piece of exercise equipment that you can imagine. 
And there's a lot of it out there. And some of it's quite expensive. I've seen some of that stuff over $5,000. You know, you're sitting on the airplane, you're reading those little magazines in the back of the seat, and they always have one that has all this stuff for these rich guys, that, these businessmen that fly from here to there to show them how they can exercise while, you know, they're on their business trips to make sure that they stay in good physical shape and all that kind of I've seen things up to $5,000 that do all kinds of things, work out all kinds of muscles at the same time, just laugh. You know, you could buy every one of those things. You could set up your gym for yourself, and you could look at it and admire those machines every day, but if you never get on one of those machines, it does you no good. Those who by reason of use have exercised their senses to discern both good and evil. Why do we not have young people who have a Christian mind today? Why do we not have young people today who don't know the mind of Christ? Why do we have young people today who can't make up their mind? Why do we have young people today uh, who do not understand that you have to stand against evil? Who excuse what's going on around them because we as parents have excused it. Parents who excuse smoking and then wonder why their kids are into drugs. Why don't our kids think like Christians? Let's move on. The next one of the key instructional elements. Next thing is a key instructional element. So we've had key principle, key application, key verses. Now we're going to add a key instructional element. The key instructional element out of this section of text is that Moses followed his instructions precisely. That's the issue of obedience. That's a key principle that even unsaved parents all over the world try to teach their kids. So in terms of child training principles, what we've seen, key principle, Failure to apply doctrine in holy living always results in judgmental blindness. Key application, don't think that you know what you're not practicing. Key verses, the verses that explain the problem, we won't go over all those verses again. And now four, we're adding the key instructional element, the issue of precise obedience. If we follow God's instructions with precision, we will have his blessing. If we're sloppy and disobedient about following his instructions, we will pay for it. God is a God of order and precision. He expects his children to follow his example and not be slothful, careless, or sloppy in our obedience to his word. It's not enough to do, know it. Remember, we just talked about that. Not enough to know it if you never put it into lifestyle. God expects diligence, commitment, and faithfulness to his word regardless of the inconvenience involved. All of us function, or at least most of the time, most of us function on the basis of convenience, on the basis of comfort, on the basis of whether or not it's going to cost us something. But God expects diligent commitment and faithful obedience to his word regardless of the inconvenience involved. Our obedience is to be a perpetual obedience, morning, noon, and night. Look at the text. Verse 24 and 25, You shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. That's perpetual. It shall come to pass when you become into the land which the Lord shall give you according as he hath promised that ye shall keep this service. It doesn't matter where you are. You can be here, you can be in China, you can be in South America, you can be at the North Pole, you can be in Antarctica, you can be at Tierra del Fuego sailing around with Magellan. you got to obey it all the time. Our obedience is to be everywhere that we are. When you come into the land which the Lord shall give you, according as they promised, you shall keep the service. God doesn't want to hear excuses. He doesn't. Did you know that? God doesn't want to hear excuses. Now, we, I think we're all intellectually sent to that. But how many times do we give him excuses? God doesn't want to hear excuses when he gives a command. Moses tried that business. Moses, go talk to Pharaoh. But take a can. Stutter. God didn't want to hear his excuse. Moses, who made your tongue. God doesn't want to hear your excuses or my excuses either. Look at this in the context of the chastening hand of God, judgmental blindness. So I have a question for those of you who are parents. What happens to a child, and the rest of you know the answer to this, even if you've never been parents. What happens to a child who knows the truth, babbles it with his mouth, but does not, not do it or obey it? What happens to that child? He knows it. You know he knows it because he can babble it back at you, but he doesn't do it or obey it. What happens to him? Child training here, folks. It's how God trains us 
and how we're supposed to train our children and our grandchildren because this is intergenerational according to our text. Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the profession. Now, the profession is what you say with your mouth. So here's a group of people that Paul's writing to. I think they were Jews at Jerusalem immediately before the destruction of the Second, second Temple era. Let us hold fast the profession, our mouth. The guy knows it, he talks it, of our faith without wavering. In other words, don't change your view on the thing. Don't wishy-washy. Or like Margaret Thatcher said to George Bush, don't go wobbly on me, George. For he is faithful that promised. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. We have a responsibility for one another in this. Not just the pastor has a responsibility for you, but we have a responsibility for one another in this. To provoke one another unto love and to good works. Oh, not just to love. We all love each other. They don't count on us to do anything. Somebody else will do it. Somebody else will change the toilet paper roll. Somebody else will put up the paper in the bathroom. Somebody else will clean the toilets. Somebody else will vacuum the uh, auditorium. Somebody else will do this. Somebody else will do that. Somebody else will pick up the trash that's on the lawn. I'm meddling. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Do you know what that means? That means going to church. Even when it's tough. You know, that was incredibly hard for the, the Jewish believers at Jerusalem to do when this was written. They had really good excuses for not showing up. The authorities might raid the church and we'd get thrown in the huskow. If you don't know what that means, ask me afterwards, you weren't from Texas. But exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. In other words, that's something that we really... Not just the preacher. You know, I harass some of you an awful lot on that subject. but we're supposed to be doing it with one another. You see somebody missing in church, do you follow up on them? You give them a call. Exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. We talked about that at the beginning of this message. We are about to go belly up in the United States. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Are you doing it with one another? Dear people, we're talking practical application of Scripture. This is plain stuff. I'm not talking in a fog. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Verse 26. For if we sin willfully. What's your context? The context is skipping church. Willful sin, the context is skipping church. If we sin willfully, the context is skipping church. After that we have received the knowledge of the truth, here we are back to that same theme again. We know it, but we're not doing it. After that we have received the knowledge, that's knowing it. That's knowing it. But not doing it. Horrifying last phrase. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. I could spend a whole sermon on that, and our time's already up. But a certain fearful for of looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. You know what God's going to do to all the pagans. Did you look at it in the context here? This is written to believers. A certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. But he's warning them. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Hmm. This is a death penalty kind of a sin. Context. Willfully sinning by skipping church. I know I'm preaching to the choir. Of how much sorer punishment. Sorer punishment. Sorer than being stoned to death under the law of Moses. Something that's worse to experience than being Burned with fire, as happened to a priest's daughter who committed adultery in the Old Testament. Stoned to death, burned with fire. Something worse for believers today. Of how much sorer punishment, suppose you, shall he be thought worthy. That's in the age of grace, not the law. We're in the age of grace when Hebrews is written. Who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite under the Spirit of grace. What was the context? 
That's what happens to you when you cut out of church for your own petty carnal reasons. I'm not making it up, folks. You can study that passage up and down and backwards and forwards. You can study it in English and you can study it in Greek. And that's the conclusion you will come to. Don't try to shove it under the rug. Don't try to hide it. Don't try to ignore it. It's there and it's God's word. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, oh, the next phrase. The Lord shall judge all those wicked pagans out there. Well, we know that's true, but that's not what it says. The Lord shall judge his people. You know, it's time for us to get serious with God. We have a country that is about to die. And the principal reason that it is about to die is we have failed to be the salt and the light that we're supposed to be. The salt preserves. The light exposes. And we fail to do that because we've led our carnal, little, petty, American, I feel good kind of lives. And our country is about to die. Now, I know some of you are just thinking, oh, well, the preacher's being, you know, you know he, he, he's sort of off the wall anyway. We know him. Pastor Spencer always takes those extreme positions. Wait and see. The Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, let me give you the application question. We're going to have to stop here. But at least I'll end with the application question. What excuses do you give to God? I'm not talking about what excuses you give to yourself. I'm not talking about what excuses do you give to your family. I'm not talking about what excuses do you give to the pastor or what excuses you give to other people. What excuses do you give to God? And in the context of Hebrews, for missing church or being perpetually late. What excuses do you give to God? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. You mean serious business with your people. You're not dancing ballet with us and pussyfooting around. You expect immediate obedience exact, precise obedience. We don't have to do it in the flesh. We can do it in the power of your spirit because you've promised it. You never give us a command that you don't also give us the empowerment to obey. Help us, Father, to remember the applications as well as the interpretations of your word. Help us to know that exegesis does not end with excuses. We thank you, Father, for your word and for its power. We pray that you will use your word, not the words of this preacher, but your word, to convict our hearts that we might be obedient children who function as salt and light in this culture, in this time, in this location, as those who know and fear the holy living God. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.